All right, Beowulf is our subject again today. And uh, on the whiteboard here, I have an outline of some of the themes uh, that I think are really important in the poem. Uh, I did mention last time that uh, we haven't got to the second encounter yet, which will be between Beowulf and Grendel's mother. There are three monsters, if you recall, Grendel, Grendel's mother, and then the dragon. The first two uh, take place when Beowulf is a hero, when he's a young man, and when he, to some degree, has nothing to lose, he, uh, uh, other than his life. But uh, we're going to read a speech of his uh, shortly where he suggests that, in fact, uh, the purpose of life is to do glorious things since we're all going to die anyway. Uh, it's better to do so uh, for the purposes of glory. And in that, he sounds very much like what we read about in the Greek epic, this idea of living a memorable, meaningful life. That's the best you can do if you're going to die anyway. Make sure that you die well, uh, rather than uh, die in your old age with no glory. That's, that's Achilles' rationale as well. He'd rather die young and glorious than of old age. Now, we found uh, when he's in the underworld and speaking to Odysseus, he changes his mind and doesn't care about the glory. So there, it's really interesting that these texts, as strongly as they live a heroic ideal and speak of this, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction even within the text. It's, they're not simple or straightforward. Uh, there are genuine losses uh, of, uh, in, in this life, but even more so their view of, of the afterlife is not satisfactory to those heroes that are living the heroic ideal. When they go down to death, they are in a bad place. They don't have the consolations of heaven. They have no, they have no sense that things will be better in the afterlife. It's a, there's only loss. And that's the, the three themes that I put up there as well. These three themes are, are emphasized repeatedly in the story. The importance of remembering what happened? We're going to tell the tales. You know the tale already of Beowulf. It's, it's, it's known. But I'm going to tell you the story anyway. And we'll talk about his glory and that the, the three battles will be about glory. But there's also this pervasive sense uh, from the perspective of the uh, pagans, the heathens, uh, and they're described as such by the Christian poet. From their perspective, it's all futile. Everything that transpires will uh, avail nothing in the end because as we saw even last time, uh, what, is, what is his comment about Hirot? Uh, line 80 of the poem, the, the, the hall towered, so Hirot was the name he had settled on it, whose utterance was law, nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. The hall towered, its gables wide and high and awaiting a barbarous burning. It's already talking about the future when this great magnificent symbol of the civilization of the day is going to be torched and burnt to the ground. There'll be nothing left. And so Beowulf, who's coming in to defend Herat and defend the people, is doing something that will ultimately prove futile. So that sense of futility is pervasive in the poem. It's, it's important that one does heroic deeds it's important to remember them, but at the end of the day, they avail you nothing. So there's vanity. Vanity. Now that's the comment of the Christian poet on the heathen life. They have no hope beyond this life. And so Beowulf is the best of the lot of them. There's no doubt about that. Now Beowulf is not a Christian. The, the, the figure the hero is not. The writer commenting on him is talking about that great heroic life that he lived that needs to be remembered, but ultimately it is not a satisfactory life. And why he writes that and comments on it, we, we don't know. We don't even know the name of the poet. But that, those are the emphases there, and I think it's really interesting. The other thing I want to talk about, and uh, now that we're going to get to the second two monsters, uh, is that they seem to represent different things. So the first beast and monster, uh, his name is Grendel, he is a misshapen male. 
a misshapen man. He's a man, sort of. He's a descendant of Cain, so he's a man, right? And yet he is so huge and misshapen that he seems a monster. And he's described, actually, there's a book of monsters in the ancient, uh, uh, the ancient in, the, in the medieval world. I, can't, I think it's actually called the Lever Monstrum. And there are 120 monsters named, and Grendel, Grendel's mother, and the dragon are three of those that are mentioned. So there's a whole variety of monsters being uh, described in that book. And the uh, Grendel seems to be a man, but yet a monstrous man. There's something wrong about him. And it's not just his character. He, even his physique is, is misshapen. Likewise, his mother. So he's a misshapen man. His mother is a misshapen woman. Then the two together are humanity in all of their perversity and monstrosity represented in those two figures. The third figure, the dragon, uh, is something totally different altogether. There's nothing human in it. There's nothing that uh, we're, we're told that that Grendel is implacable in his wrath. So is his mother. But the dragon is different. You can't defeat a dragon. The dragon is a relentless, restless malice. And in, in the Norse saga, uh, actually there are two dragons even mentioned here, ones I referred to uh, in one of the songs sung. Uh, a dragon encompasses the whole world with its tail. It's a symbol of evil. It's devouring its tail, um, Ouroboros. Um, referred to in, uh, and, and it's part of the Norse uh, mythology that this be the case. So this is a figure of, of not just chaos, but destruction and malice and, and no care for human beings at all. So Grendel and his mother are hostile towards Herat. The dragon is indifferent. It's worse. There's almost a, there's a hostility there, but the dragon is relentless and it is just all destructive and it doesn't care about anything except its treasure. A more monstrous thing than the, than the previous two monsters. Now, they differ also, and I said this, in terms of the timeline in which the hero confronts them. He confronts Grendel and his mother when he's a young man, full of the strength of years. When he's a hero and has nothing to lose, remember he comes to the aid of a king who has a great deal to lose and does not want to spend his life and lose his life and leave his kingdom unguarded. He's there to keep the peace, but losing his life will mean opening up his kingdom to the ravages of other tribes around him. So this is something he does not want to do. He, he wants to go to battle at, at the very last cost, if that is going to be the consequence, and it would be. And uh, kings are there actually to keep the peace. It becomes part of the coronation oaths of the Anglo-Saxon kings and, and the kings of England. They are there and they actually, uh, part of the coronation oath is that they will make an oath to keep the peace. So not go to war, not bring wars into the kingdom because they, wars are a destructive thing. You may, because kings want glory, they want to be remembered, but with those wars of, uh, of glory for the king comes destruction for the people of the kingdom. And so they swear in their coronation oath not to go on, uh, well, they swear to keep the peace. Peace is seen as a good thing, and kings are there to preserve that. Beowulf is not there to keep the peace. He is the necessary evil to take care of the great monsters that have encroached upon Hurat. But, and when he, when it comes that there is no king left, so when, when Hujalak dies, or Hrothgar dies, both will die. Uh, the king, the crown is thrust to Beowulf, and Beowulf doesn't want to be king. Because he doesn't want the responsibility that comes with it. It's not because he's an irresponsible man. It's because he will, ha he will be a different, he will have a different uh, burden in life. Heavy is the head upon which the crown sits. The burdens of, uh, and uh, the cares of leadership are different, and he has to be a different man. 
And in the end, so when at the end, when, and we'll come to his uh, treatment of the dragon, uh, when he rides out to meet the dragon, there's a, there's a question in the minds of the audience and the readers whether this was the right thing to do. Because he's a key, you can't, you can't live an encounter with a dragon. You can't survive it. And when he dies, which he does, which we know from the outset he's going to die, when he does die, he leaves his kingdom unprotected. So he was a good hero. Was he a good king? They're two different things. Uh, Winston Churchill was a great prime minister during the Second World War, a hero. He was thrown out in peacetime. I'm not saying he was a bad prime minister in peacetime, but there are different uh, requirements in those times. Uh, sometimes the virtues of the hero are not the virtues of the, uh, the civilized culture. They're not honored. Note how the military is treated in our day with contempt by politicians. In times of war, things would change quite significantly on that front, uh, which is not a reason to go to war, by the way. <laughs> But some w w wish the, that there were a war because actually even in times of peace, and this is what uh, many works of literature will, will describe to us, even in times of peace there is a war on, it's just not open war. It's a corrosive entropy. It's the battle of a pernicious relativism corroding moral goodness. And it would be better if you faced an enemy in battle. But here the battle is not, uh, in times of peace, is not open and obvious. And uh, Christians will say that that's because our enemies are not flesh and blood. In either case, actually, there's a spiritual power beneath and behind that. And to some degree, the, the, the dragon may represent that, although it's a physical manifestation. It's not Satan. Don't, don't, uh, don't take the dragon to be a reference to uh, Satan, although he is called a worm. And you could see he does represent evil of some sort, but it's not a figure for Satan. Anyway, so let me come to the text uh, where we left off. And uh, we, we left off with Beowulf having defeated uh, Grendel and uh, Beowulf being celebrated. And one of the things that we note about this is that the figure of Beowulf uh, is celebrated not just for his, his terrific fighting prowess, although that is emphasized. He's, he's so strong he can swim for six days and he can dive down into the ocean and fight sea beasts. And he, he defeats uh, Grendel with his bare hands. A monster, he, he defeats him with his bare hands. So he is a martial figure. He's full of prow the prowess of the hero, just like Achilles. But in addition to that, he's also a great speaker. So his words and his deeds are both emphasized here. So there's something of the well-rounded character here. And, and that is true of the Anglo-Saxon culture. There's a great uh, value placed upon speak, speaking, as well as being virtuous. And virtue is demonstrated in both. Now, I think that's true of the Greek world as well. Um, and I don't agree with the assessment that Achilles is just a killing machine. He, he himself is a great speaker. He's a well-rounded character. But it's true that his, his military might is is by far the greater emphasis in, in the Iliad than Odysseus's words are in the Odyssey. Like he gives all sorts of speeches and he's always using words to deceive and to trick and so forth. He's famous for his speaking, right? But let's come to this. So uh, in line it is, uh, where is it? Uh, and and when, they, when he wins, by the way, uh, he is given all sorts of gifts. Now this is what a a good king gives to those who are faithful to them. He gives them gifts uh, as a sign of his glory, among other things. Just like in the uh, Odyssey, we saw that the uh, figures of, uh, of greatness were given great material wealth as a symbol of their excellence. And there the word was arete. Or excellence. And that, in, that included their uh, aristocratic position in life. So to, to be truly excellent, you had to be an aristocrat. You had to be a prince. 
you also had to be virtuous. You also had to be, have mar military victories. You had to be a good speaker and you had to be rich. And the wealth was a symbol of the favor of the gods, right? It showed that you were a, a well-rounded, these, these were the visible signs of your, of your good character as well. So it, and that's how the Iliad began. The fight began when uh, Agamemnon took away the prize of Achilles. He took the girl and he said, that's my prize. Like she's my, what I, I won in, in battle, that sh she was the thing. Now, yeah, I think he also loves the girl, but that's a different thing. It's more, but this is what, she is a symbol of what a good warrior I have been and you're taking her away because you have power, but there's no justification for that and you're dishonoring me in the process. And so he won't fight. Anyway, uh, on to this. So the, I, I'll read the cup was carried to him. Beowulf sat between the brothers, Hrethric and Hrothmund, the other noble's sons. So now he's being put amongst the nobility. And the cup was carried to him, kind words spoken and welcome, and a wealth of wrought gold, 1192, graciously bestowed. Two arm bangles, a male shirt and rings, and the most resplendent torque of gold. So it's a, it's a golden, I don't even know, like it's not a necklace, it's a, uh, a band uh, around his neck. Uh, of the like that he says, I, I have ever heard of the most resplendent. It is the most resplendent I've ever heard tell of anywhere on earth or under heaven. There was no hoard like it since Hama snatched the Brawzing's neck chain and bore it away. So this is a great gift. And he wore this. And, uh, and then there's a story about uh, one that had had this before. And then the applause fills the hall. And we all Theo pronounces in the presence of the company, 1216, take delight in this torque, dear Beowulf, wear it for luck and wear also this mail from our people's armory. May you prosper in them. Be acclaimed for strength, for kindly guidance to these two boys and your bounty will be sure. You have won renown, you are no, known to all men, far and near, now and forever. Your sway is wide as the wind's home, as the sea around cliffs. And so, my prince, I wish you a lifetime's luck and blessings to enjoy this treasure. Treat my sons with tender care. Be strong and kind. Now, this is interesting as well. If you remember in the Odyssey, uh, one of the great concerns of uh, that culture, and I expressed it through this word paideia, was the, uh, the nurture and upbringing of the youth. It's used in Ephesians 6, verse 4, by the way, that word, same word, paideia. Fathers, educate your sons in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The nurture there is the paideia. It's a well-rounded moral education. And Beowulf is charged, this hero, with being a mentor figure for the two sons of the king. That's how, about, so now he's a teacher, as it were, but teacher by his conduct. Do what Beowulf does. He's such a good man. I want you two to be like him. And so this is also an honor done to Beowulf. You're, I mean, I'm entrusting you, uh, my own two sons. And, and the need then of a good example is being demonstrated here. So the Thanes, uh, he says, treat my sons with tender care, be strong and kind. Here each comrade is true to the other, loyal to Lord, loving in spirit. The thanes have one purpose, the people are ready, having drunk and pledged the ranks, do as I bid. And now they're all downing their drinks. And at the point of that celebration, the second monster creeps in. Let's pick it up, uh, 1252. They went to sleep. Well, actually, I'm going to conclude with the just before that, the narrator's comment on those heathen people. He says, it was their habit always and everywhere to be ready for action, at home or in the camp, in whatever case and at whatever time the need arose to rally around their Lord. They were a right people. They were ready for action. 
they were um, a good people. They were faithful to one another. So it's a description by a Christian author of a community that has ge the genuine bonds of fellowship in it. And then they went to sleep. And one paid dearly for the, his night's ease, as had happened to them often, ever since Grendel occupied the gold hall, committing evil until the end came, death after his crimes. Then it became clear, obvious to everyone, once the fight was over, that an avenger lurked and was still alive, grimly biding time. Grendel's mother, monstrous hell bride, brooded on her wrongs. She had been forced down into fearful waters, the cold depths after Cain had killed his father's son, felled his own brother with a sword. Branded an outlaw, marked by having murdered, he moved into the wilds, shunning, shunned company and joy. And from Cain there sprang misbegotten spirits, among them Grendel, the banished and accursed, due to come to grips with that watcher in Herat waiting to do battle. The monster wrenched and wrestled with him, but Beowulf was mindful of his mighty strength, the wondrous gifts God had showered on him. He relied for help on the Lord of all, on his care and favor. Lest we think that this was all Beowulf's strength, it was his trust in God that had brought him the victory. That's made clear by the narrator here. Now, an interesting uh, commentary. But so he overcame the foe, brought down the hell brute. Okay. Broken and bowed, outcast from all sweetness, the enemy of mankind made for his death den. So having his arm ripped off, he then tries to go back home and he's bleeding to death. He's bleeding out from the wound in his shoulder. But now his mother had sallied forth on a savage journey, grief racked and ravenous, desperate for revenge. She came to Herat. There inside the hall, Danes lay asleep. Earls who would soon endure a great reversal once Grendel's mother attacked and entered. Her onslaught was less only by as much as an Amazon warrior's strength is less than an armed man's when the hefted sword, its hammered edge and gleaming blade slathered in blood, raises the sturdy boar ridge off a helmet. Then in the hall, hard honed swords were grabbed from the bench, many a broad shield lifted and braced. There was little thought of helmets or woven mail when they woke in terror. The Helldam was in panic, desperate to get out in mortal terror the moment she was found. She had pounced and taken one of the retainers in a tight hold, then headed for the fen. So she goes out to the swamp. To Hrothgar, this man was the most beloved of the friends he trusted between the two seas. She had done away with a great warrior, ambushed him at rest. Beowulf was elsewhere. Earlier, after the award of the treasure, the Yad had been given another lodging. There was uproar in Herat. She had snatched their trophy, Grendel's bloodied hand. It was a fresh blow in the afflicted bond. The bargain was hard, both parties having to pay with the lives of friends. And the old lord, the gray-haired warrior, was heart sore and weary when he heard the news. His highest placed advisor, his dearest companion, was dead and gone. And now, Beowulf is brought back into the fray. And I, I'm going to skip over some of the lines and I'll pick it up at 1383 with Beowulf's great speech. And this is in response uh, to the uh, atrocity that's just been committed. And he's responding now to Hrothgar, the king. Yes. So yes. Well, they're, they, they're polytheists, among other things. Right. And uh, it's not at all, no. So it's interesting, uh, the narrator, the Christian narrator, who's telling this story of a, of a heathen hero 
is commenting on the genuine worldly heroism of the hero and what motivates him and, and is willing to acknowledge there's a goodness in his deeds and that he praises the fellowship, the oaths, the symbol, like, and, and the symbol of, so all of those things. But they're ultimately, as I say, and we should remember those deeds. That's why he's telling the poem or he's writing the poem because it's to be remembered. And there is a glory there. And yet at the end of the day, that glory is futile. It, it cannot last. It does not last. Even Hurat, which they uh, sought to save, was burned to the ground by a later group of barbarians, raiders. So after all of these episodes have taken place, the dragon killed, uh, another band will come in and burn it to the ground. So ultimately, the whole story is of futility. That's lurking in the background. There's always that sense of however heroic these events are, and he certainly regards them as heroic, they don't last into the, a life beyond this life. There's no afterlife. There's no reward for virtue aside from the name. And let's let Beowulf speak those words because these, he represents this very well. So 1383, Beowulf, son of Ecthio, spoke. Wise sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. For every one of us living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. The only thing that stands. Is, will be his glorious death. The glory is the only thing. Now it's Beowulf's own description. He will at least, if everyone's going to die, at least he will have lived a noble life worthy of being remembered. Uh, Odysseus has the same view. Achilles has the same view. That's the heathen view. That's the best that you can do. And it is genuinely good. You benefit your fellow mankind by doing these great deeds. But ultimately, they will come to naught because life is a vanity. It goes down to the grave with you. Yes? You that's, Beowulf's that's Beowulf's speech. That's not the poet. It's the Beowulf. That's Beowulf, the character, speaking that. That's what the, uh, the narrator says he did. He relied on God. He doesn't call upon God, Beowulf. So that sounds contradictory. So the narrator says what his actions were versus what his words are. Yeah, it's sort of, I, 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 I recognize what you're saying there as a, a problem. He had faith uh, in a power of that goodness would prevail over evil. Right? And he trusted that and, that, and therefore I'm going to uh, I not need weapons. If, he, if, if Grendel doesn't have a, a weapon, I'm not going to use a weapon. And it's a, he trusted in God there. It's a funny old thing to do when he doesn't believe in God. And yet it, there's a comment uh, almost by the narrator, the Christian narrator, that actually even heathen cultures do acknowledge God in some ways, even though they worship false gods and idols within their, they, they, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's what Romans 1 says, that all of the man, all mankind knows that there is only one God. They know him by his power and his, uh, his might, and his works are seen in the things that are made. Like they're, they're, visit, they're, they're clearly manifest. No one can deny that there's a um, intelligent designer and that his power is at work. That's obvious to all, but they suppress that in unrighteousness. And Beowulf does that as well, but actually uh, to do the deeds that he did, he was relying on God. So that's what he's saying. I think there's a sort of a secret motivation almost. That's my reading of it at any rate. Yeah, because, well, he doesn't speak of his hope for seeing God face to face and living uh, in his presence forever. There's no mention of that, right? And thereby, uh, and that this is why the Christian poet thinks that even these deeds are worthy of being remembered because, because uh, even if you don't believe in God, 
you still believe in God. <laughs> you actually can't live without acting as if God and there wasn't a preserver of order. It's not possible to live a life that way. And the best always do implicitly acknowledge God in their good deeds. Because where's the glory? What's the, I mean, if you're a Darwinist and you think that everything is just a creaturely impulse for survival and so forth, there's no glory in that. That's just a, you know, the word glory applied to that, that's just, I don't know, sort of a delusion. There's no glory in it. And yet they, the, the heathen world believes that there is glory in defending your country and your ought and, and praising those who are brave and virtuous. Well, they're implicitly acknowledging God when they do this, says the narrator. That's how I read it at any rate. But for, as for Beowulf himself, he says, when a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark, the glory he won in death. That's it. That's all that's left. So arise, my lord, says Beowulf, and let us immediately set forth on the trail of this troll dam. I guarantee you she will not get away, not to dens underground or upland groves, nor the ocean floor. She'll have nowhere to flee to. Endure your troubles today, bear up, and be the man I expect you to be. Beowulf now speaking to the king. Be the man I expect you to be. Don't lament the loss of your trusted advisor. With that, the old lord sprang to his feet and praised God for Beowulf's pledge. Now, does he call upon God? No. He praises the power that, but, but it's a, the Christian interpretation of what he uttered there. Now, what he's doing there, and I, I'm not reading this in this class, but Augustine talks about how Christians can read heathen works and benefit from them. And the, what he says in there, and I think it's quite powerful in it, also rings has the ring of truth to me is that he uses the illustration of um, the uh, Moses and the people of Israel in the land of Egypt what did they do when they left the land of Egypt well there were obviously the 12 play or the 10 plagues and so forth and then they departed but we're told that they plundered the Egyptians and that the Egyptians gave them stuff they gave them gold, treasures, all sorts of, they gave them all sorts of gifts and said, get out. And they, at the same time, the people of Israel demanded that they give them, you know, give us these things, and they gladly gave it to them. Gold, the purpose of which was then used to uh, decorate the temple of God. So it's a, it, they used it for the right purpose. In, Isra in Egypt, it was used to, to serve idols. It was used for false purposes, but they used it and redeemed it for its proper purpose, which is to give the one true God glory. That's what it was. So it's, he talks about plundering the Egyptians, and with that sort of rationale in mind, that's why we read works like Be the, the Heroism of Beowulf. We can take what's good there and spit out the bad, more or less. You don't have to swallow it all. You don't have to believe in a polytheistic worldview. They themselves are dissatisfied with the polytheistic worldview. They don't like the view of the afterlife. It, there's no consolation in it. The heroism that they speak of is marked by futility. It's there in the stories. Achilles himself says that I'd rather have lived uh, the poorest of men like a slave and lived a longer life than be down here and with all the glory that you're ascribing to me. That is a pretty desperate statement. So we can read it and we can take something from it, but we're not to regard it as an ultimate thing, but it's still a good thing. That's what he's doing here, I think. So he springs to his feet uh, and um, Beowulf got ready, 1442, donned his war gear indifferent to death. His mighty hand forged fine webbed mail would soon meet with the menace underwater. It would keep the bone cage of his body safe. This is one of those kennings again, the bone cage. I think he's talking your ribs. That's the bone cage. No enemy's clasp could crush him in it. No vicious arm lock choke his life out. To guard his head, he had a glittering helmet that was due to be muddied on the mere bottom and blurred in the upswirl. It was of beaten gold, princely headgear, hooped 
and hasped by a weaponsmith who had worked wonders in days gone by and adorned it with boar shapes. Note these are, this is old armor, which is the best armor. Old stuff is the best stuff, and in particular swords. By the way, there I think there's something between 28 and 30 words used in the Anglo-Saxon here for swords. The poet <laughs> of Beowulf loves swords. Like there's a lot of different words for swords. And, and he comes to this one. And another item lent by Unferth. Now remember Unther, Unferth, I remember I mentioned him. He was the one who, f who flighted Beowulf or, or trash talked him and said, you know, you're not the hero you're said to be, etc., etc. And then Beowulf retorted in kind. But now um, Unferth gives him a sword. And I'll read on here. And at that moment of need was of no small importance. The Breton handed him a hilted weapon, a rare and ancient sword named Hrunting. Ah, this sword has a name. Just like uh, Aragorn's sword has a name in Tolkien. This, the, the best swords are not only old, they have a name. Just like often uh, the steeds of heroes have names, right? But here it's, it's Hrunting. The iron blade with its ill-boding patterns had been tempered in blood. It had never failed the hand of anyone who hefted it in battle. Anyone who had fought and faced the worst in the gap of danger. This was not the first time it had been called to perform heroic feats. So we have the hero and now we have the weapons worthy of a hero. When he lent that blade to the better swordsman, Unferth, the strong-built son of Eklaf, could hardly have remembered the ranting speech he had made in his cups when he'd had a few too many drinks. He was not man enough to face the turmoil of a fight underwater and the risk to his life. So, the, so there he lost fame and repute. Comment by the narrator here. It was different for the other, rigged out in his gear, ready to do battle. And then he gives a speech before he goes. And I'll do that and then I'll come to the fight. Wisest of kings, says Beowulf, now that I have come to the point of action, I ask you to recall what we said earlier, that you, son of half Dane and gold friend to retainers, that you, if I should fall and suffer death while serving your cause, would act like a father to me afterward. If this combat kills me, take care of my young company, my comrades in arms. And be sure also, my beloved Hrothgar, to send Hujalak the treasures I received. Let the Lord of the Yats gaze on that gold. Let Hrethel's son take note of it and see that I found a ring giver of rare magnificence <coughs> and enjoyed the good <coughs> of his generosity. And Unferth is to have what I inherited. To that far-famed man, I bequeath my own sharp-honed, wave-sheened wonder blade. With fronting, I shall gain glory or die. So here, Unferth gives him his sword, the best, a, a better sword. But in response, he gives him a gift back. So there's a peace being given. Shown, uh, magnanimity is being shown. He's a great souled man, as Aristotle would describe him. I'm going to show um, generosity to a man who slighted me. So that, with that, he goes on. <laughs> um, it doesn't take long to come to this. He goes down to the water and he jumps into the water, dives into the heaving depths of the lake, 1496. It was the best part of a day before he could see the solid bottom. So what sort of a man is this? I think Beowulf himself is a sort of a monster. Hujalak is mentioned in the Book of the Monsters, by the way. And so... Um, if you want to read a great work on this, read Tolkien's uh, little essay called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, because it's, it's really about what do we do with these monsters and with Beowulf. What did the critics make of this? Because this is a figure that's really hard to reckon with. Be Beowulf probably means something like a bear. The bear-like man. This is me men can't swim all day down to the bottom of a lake. They have to take breath, right? But this guy swims down. He's a man, and yet there's something monstrous about him. 
something uh, almost immortal, although he's like a godlike rather, just like Achilles and Odysseus. But it was the best part of a day before he could see the solid bottom. Quickly the one who haunted those waters, who had scavenged and gone her gluttonous rounds for a hundred seasons, sensed a human observing her outlandish lair from above. So she lunged and clutched and managed to catch him in her brutal grip. But his body, for all that, remained unscathed. The mesh of the chainmail saved him on the outside. Her savage talons failed to rip the web of his war shirt. Then once she touched bottom, that wolfish swimmer carried the ring-mailed prince to her court, so that for all his courage, he could never use the weapons he carried. And a bewildering horde came at him from the depths, droves of sea beasts in a ghastly onslaught. So not just Grendel's mother, but all sorts of sea beasts are attacking him as well. The gallant man could see he had entered some hellish turn hole, and yet the water there did not work against him because the hull roofing held off the force of the current. Then he saw firelight, a gleam and flare up, a glimmer of brightness. The hero observed that swamp thing from hell, the tarn hag in all her terrible strength, then heaved his war sword and swung his arm. The decorated blade came down ringing and singing on her head, but he soon found his battle torch extinguished. The shining blade refused to bite. It spared her and failed the man in his need. It had gone through many a hand-to-hand -hand fight. It had hewed the armor and helmets of the doomed, but here at last the fabulous powers of that heirloom failed. Now this is a desperate state. We have a, a weapon that has never failed to vanquish uh, the enemy against which it was wielded, and here it doesn't even bite into her. So what is he going to do? Huge Lack's kinsman kept thinking about his name and fame. He never lost heart. Then in a fury he flung his sword away, the keen inlaid worm loop patterned steel was hurled to the ground, he would have to rely on the might of his arm. So must a man do who intends to gain enduring glory in a combat. Life doesn't cost him a thought. When the Prince of Warriats, warming to this fight with Grendel's mother, gripped her shoulder and laid about him in a battle frenzy, now he's thinking, well, here we go again, the shoulder. He's got the shoulder grip, it's all over. He pitched his killer opponent to the floor, but she rose quickly and retaliated, grappled him tightly in her grim embrace. The sure-footed warrior felt daunted. The strongest of warriors stumbled and fell. So she pounced upon him and pulled out a broad, wetted knife. Now she would avenge her only child, but the mesh of chainmail on Beowulf's shoulder shielded his life, turned the edge and tip of the blade. The son of Ecthio would have surely perished, and the Yats lost their warrior under the wide earth, had the strong links and locks of his war gear not helped to save him. The poet's comment, holy God decided the victory. It was easy for the Lord, the ruler of heaven, to redress the balance once Beowulf got back up on his feet. Now, you get the sense here. Beowulf in his own strength, he's done. He can't can't kill Grendel's mother. Like Grendel, he ripped his arm off. Grendel's mother, he grabs her shoulder. That's not going to work this time. She picks him up and slams him. And then pulls the knife out, and the only thing that saves him is his ring mail. But he can't beat her. She's invincible to him. But it was easy for the Lord, the rule of heaven, to redress the balance once he got back up on his feet. Now, that's not Beowulf the character's comment, it's the narrator's comment. Yes? What's the spiritual significance do you think of the, the chain mail? Like it's even on the cover and it's mentioned a few times as saving him. Do you think there's something with that as well? Maybe it's the protection of the Lord or some kind of... No, chain mail's chain mail. Really? Yeah. It seems like a few times it's highlighted as helping him get... It's what they wear. 
I mean, it's what you wear under the plate mail. Your plate mail you wear when you ride. You can't walk with plate mail. You have to ride on it like on a horse because it's really heavy. You can't. So when knights, uh, um, when, if you ever see knights battling on horses and they come off the horses, I mean, they're really <laughs> they're walking like this because it's really heavy, first of all. And secondly, it, it's not very mobile. So you're clanking around and you swing and miss. You're going to fall down to the ground and the, you, know, you can't get back up. You need somebody to help you get by. I mean, it's almost comical, but chainmail is underneath that, and it, it, you know, it's really tight steel links, and it, you know, it protects you from a fight. It's just a form of armor. And would it be like unheard of for them to go out without that? Oh yeah. That would even be thought of. Well, he did it in the first instance, right? He had nothing on. He had no, he had no protection. Whereas here he does. So he's not, just because it worked with Grendel, he, we're not going to be thinking we're just going to keep on doing that. Like why not have weaponry? He did it in the first instance to show because he was basically a young man and thinking, ah, you know, it doesn't matter if I die. If, if, she, if he doesn't have uh, armor and weapons, I won't either. But now that he's won a little bit of glory, eh, okay, we'll put on that. The, these are symbols of his military or her heroism he's going to wear those and he needs them it says in fact it, they're the only thing that saved his life but that's not what gives him the victory it's god that does according to the poet then he saw a blade that boded well a sword in her armory an ancient heirloom from the days of the giants an ideal weapon one that any warrior would envy but so huge and heavy of itself only beowulf could wield it in a battle. So the shielding's hero, hard pressed and enraged, took a firm hold of the hilt and swung the blade in an arc, a resolute blow that bit deep into her neck bone and severed it entirely, toppling the doomed house of her flesh. She fell to the floor. The sword dripped blood. The swordsman was elated. So there it is, the god its provision is this sword that was used against the giants that's so big that only Beowulf and his strength could wield it, and that's what does it. It's a miraculous appearance, this huge sword. Takes it and strikes her down. A light appeared in the place, pal place bright in the way the sky does when heaven's candle is shining clearly. He inspected the vault with sword held high, its hilt raised to guard and threaten Hujalak's thane scouted by the wall in Grendel's wake. Now the weapon was to prove its worth. The warrior determined to take revenge for every gross act Grendel had committed, and not only for that one occasion when he'd come to slaughter the sleeping troops, 15 of Hrothgar's house guards, surprised on their benches and ruthlessly devoured, and as many carried away a brutal plunder, Beowulf in his fury now settled that score. He saw the monster in his resting place, war weary and wrecked, a lifeless corpse, a casualty of the battle in Hurot. The body gaped at the stroke dealt to it after death. Beowulf cut the corpse's head off. So not only does he kill the mother, he then says, okay, you took away the arm, my treasure, I'll bring back a head. So now he takes the head back. I'm going to have a trophy. Stick that on the wall. If you think it's gruesome, it's because it is gruesome. Back he goes with the head. And uh, he goes back home and brings, and then there's another celebration. And uh, they look at this, this shield, and uh, Beowulf uh, t says that hunting. Although it is a hard-edged sword, I could never bring it to bear in battle. But the Lord of Men, this is his recount of the battle, 1661, allowed me to behold, for he often helps the unbefriended, an ancient sh sword shining on the wall, a weapon made for giants, there for the wielding. Then my moment came in the combat, and I struck the dwellers in that den. Next thing, the Damascene sword blade melted, it bloated, and it burned in their rushing blood. I have wrested the hilt from the enemy's hand, avenged the evil done to the Danes. It is what was due, 
And this I pledge, O Prince of the Shieldings, you can sleep secure with your company of troops in Hurat Hall. There, ne there need you fear, never need you feel for a single thane of your sept or nation. Young warriors are old, that laying waste of life that you and your people endured of yore. And then the gold hilt. So the sword melts away. Think of the, um, in uh, Lord of the Rings as well. There's a sword made the, and the blade and it, and it just evaporates. So that's, that's what happens here. That the sword melts away once he slays these wicked creatures, these monsters with it. And all that's left is the gold hilt. He gives the gold hilt to the king as a relic uh, and uh, got all sorts of engravings and so forth. So that's the second uh, conflict. And uh, I'll skip over that, but Beowulf then returns back home and lives there for a good long time and tells the story of what has transpired. Uh, by the way, when he recounts the story, he adds little other details that weren't there in the uh, account that he told to Hrothgar. So when he goes to Hujlak, he says a bit more about the story, but he is celebrated for his uh, heroism by the king, and rightly so. And, at the, at, uh, and then time passes. And let me look at the poet's commentary on his character. So what, we know what he's like in battle, he's a hero. But what's he like when there's no battle? What's his character like? We're, we're given a comment on that. 12, or 2176. Beowulf bore himself with valor. He was formidable in battle, yet behaved with honor and took no advantage. Never cut down a comrade who was drunk, kept his temper, and warrior that he was, watched and controlled his God-sent strength and his outstanding natural powers. He had been poorly regarded for a long time, was taken by the Yats for less than he was worth, and their lord, too, had never much esteemed him in the Mead Hall. They firmly believed that he lacked force, that the prince was a weakling. But presently, every affront to his deserving was reversed. So he's a bit, again, like, think of Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings. He, he was once strider, not well regarded. Walking around, people who regarded, esteemed him not. And then he comes forth, does a glorious deed, and now he's Aragorn. It's the return of the king. Well, here Beowulf, nothing like, quite like that. But he had lacked, uh, he had not been well regarded before, but now he has that regard. So there's a transformation. And in that, he doesn't take advantage of it. He maintains his, his virtuous conduct. So, and that's important to the poet. And he's given a gem-studded sword and he lays it on his lap. Best that can be bestowed. But we'll pick it up with the final, the last battle, 2200. Uh, let's begin with the scene setting. A lot was to happen in later days, in the fury of battle. Hujalak, who he had been down in Denmark, he went down to protect him, fell, and the shelter of Hirdred's Heer, shield proved useless against the fierce aggression of the Schilflings. These are the Swedes. Ruthless swordsmen, seasoned campaigners, they came against him in his conquering nation and with cruel force cut him down so that afterwards the wide kingdom reverted to Beowulf. Now Beowulf inherits the land that of, in which Hurat is set. He ruled it well for 50 winters. Now that's an interesting phrase. Grew old and wise as warden of the land. 50 winters, it could be also 50 summers. What's the connotations of 50 winters? These are hard seasons. Like life's hard in the winter. If it were 50, it's still 50 years, but the 50 winters gives a different sense. But he ruled it well for 50 winters, grew old and wise as warden of the land until one began to dominate the dark. It's almost again like in the Lord of the Rings where all seems good and yet there's a devil in the dark that's awoken that has never gone away and arises again. And it's, here it is 
the dragon. One began to dominate the dark, a dragon on the prowl from the steep vaults of a stone-roofed barrel where he guarded a horde. There was a hidden passage unknown to men, but someone managed to enter by it and interfere with the heathen trove. He had handled and removed a gem-studded goblet. It gained him nothing, though with a thief's wiles he had outwitted the sleeping dragon. That drove him into rage, as the people of that country would soon discover. So it's a, it's a mirror of the story of the Hobbit, if you read that. The intruder who broached the dragon's treasure and moved him to wrath had never meant to. It was desperation on the part of a slave fleeing the heavy hand of some master, guilt ridden and on the run, going to ground. But he soon began to shake with terror. In shock, the wretch panicked and ran away with the precious metalwork. So interesting. It's a hard time. There are 50 winters. Their people are not good, but Beowulf reigns with wisdom. And yet, we have a poor man who's been driven to desperation by the hard um, uh, treatment of his, his lord. And so he becomes a thief, not out because he's a greedy bad guy, but because he's desperate. So the, the wickedness that is arising in the dragon is also mirrored by a, a, a malice that's in the kingdom uh, that Beowulf is king over as well. Unwittingly, he can't prevent all evil because evil lies deep underneath all of that. But, but it's quite interesting how that's described. But he's a thief. He takes it. He doesn't do it out of any, he doesn't plan on stealing, he just comes upon it and he's desperate, he's poor. And he runs away and there were many other heirlooms heaped inside the earth house because long ago with deliberate care someone now forgotten had buried the riches of a high-born race in this ancient cache. Death had come and taken them all in times gone by and the only one left to tell their tale, the last of their line, could look forward to nothing but the same fate for himself. He foresaw that his joy in the treasure would be brief. Again, the futility. You've heaped up treasure on earth. What is it good for? Commentator of the poem. A newly constructed barrow, a barrow is a place, a burial ground, stood waiting on a wide headland close to the waves, its entryway secured into it. The keeper of the hoard had carried all the goods and golden ware worth preserving. His words were few. Now, earth, behold what earls once held and heroes can no more. It was mined from you first by honorable men. My own people have been ruined in war. One by one they went down to death, looked their last on sweet life in the hall. I am left with nobody to bear a sword or to burnish plated goblets. Put a sheen on the cup. The companies have departed. The hard helmet hasped with gold will be stripped of its hoops and the helmet shiner would who should polish the metal of the war mask sleeps. The coat of mail that came through all fights, through shield collapse and cut of sword, decays with the warrior. Nor may webbed mail range far and wide on the warlord's back beside his mustered troops. No trembling harp, no tuned timber, no tumbling hawk swerving through the hall, no swift horse pawing the courtyard. Pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples. That's the speech of the man who buries the gold that the dragon comes upon and now guards. It describes entropy and decay. So there's a life that's good, but, and yet it's like, why do we die? Well, because we're sinners. That's the theological reasons. But the, it's a physical process called entropy. The day you're born, you're going to grow to a maturity, but the, the, your days are numbered. Your cells are, are not, they are copying mistakes and then genetic mistakes. He's bringing about sicknesses, diseases and so forth, but there's a natural proclivity towards entropy, falling apart. And, and the commentator of the poet here, or, or the poet Beowulf, who puts these words in it, is talking about the futility of life, all of this treasure that's been piled up in battles, 
as a symbol of the honor and the glory is nonetheless now what can I do with it? There's nobody even to polish the gold. All of the weapons which could be used in battle, there's no one left to wield them. So I, what am I going to do? I'm just going to bury it. So he does. That's how it ended up there. It's a description of this, the futility of life. And then the dragon, an old harrower of the dark, happened to find the hoard open. The burning one who haunt, hunts out barrows, the slick-skinned dragon, threatening the night sky with streamers of fire. People on the farms are in dread of him. He is driven to hunt out hordes underground, to guard heathen gold through age-long vigils, though to little avail. For three centuries, the scour this scourge of the people had stood guard on that stoutly protected underground treasury until the intruder unleashed its fury. He hurried to his lord with the gold-plated cup and made his plea to be reinstated. Remember that the harsh taskmaster of the poor man had demanded probably that he pay back what he owed him. Now he's got the gold. Here you, here you go. I'll pay you back. He doesn't mean to benefit from it. He just wants his master to be appeased. Then the vault was rifled. The ring hoard robbed, and the wretched man had his request granted. His master gazed on that fine from the past for the first time. So he says, sure, I'll take the cup, and now you tell me where you got it, and he takes him to it. Now the master takes more from it. When the dragon awoke, trouble flared again. He rippled down the rock, writhing with anger when he saw the footprints of the prowler who had stolen too close to his dreaming head. So may a man not marked by fate easily escape exile and woe by the grace of God. That's the comment of the poet. The horde guardian scorched the ground as he scoured and hunted for the trespasser who had troubled his sleep. Hot and savage he began, and he begins to belch out flames. And far and near, 2318, uh, uh, far and near the Yat nation bore the brunt of his brutal assaults and virulent hate. Then back to the horde, he would dart before daybreak to hide in his den. He had swinged the land, swathed in flame and fire and burning, and now he felt secure in the vaults of his barrow. But his trust was unavailing. To so whose trust? The dragons. Dragon doesn't think that he can be harmed. Then Beowulf was given bad news. The hard truth, his own home, the best of buildings, had been burnt to a cinder, the throne room of the Yats. It threw the hero into deep anguish and darkened his mood. The wise man thought he must have thwarted ancient ordinance of the eternal Lord, broken his commandment. What's he immediately do? Soul searching. What did I do to anger God? To have earned this, my throne room has been burnt to the ground. It, attack on him. It's my fault because he's responsible. His mind was in turmoil. Unaccustomed anxiety and gloom confused his brain. The fire dragon had raised the coastal region and reduced fro forts and earthworks to dust and ashes. So the war king planned and plotted his revenge. The warrior's protector, prince of the hall troop, ordered a marvelous all iron shield from his smithy works. He well knew that linden boards would let him down and timber burn. So some swords have, are made of wood and they have iron just to reinforce them. That's not going to work here. I'll just burn away. I need an all-metal shield. After many trials, he was destined to face the end of his days. Now, there we already know what's going to happen. In this mortal world, as was the dragon, as was the dragon, for all his long leasehold on the treasure, yet the prince of the rings was too proud to line up with a large army against the sky plague. He had scant regard. There's a little bit of the hero in him. It's 50 years later. But a little bit too much here. Though. I'm not going to go with a big army. Yeah, remember the old days? I think I might still have a little strength in this old arm. I don't need that. 
scant regard for the dragon as a threat, no dread at all of its courage or strength, for he had kept going often in the past through perils and ordeals of every sort after he had purged Hrothgar's hall, triumphed in Hurot and beaten Grendel. He outgrappled the monster in his evil kin. So he's revisiting the glorious old days back when he was young. You know, he thinks of himself, oh good, I've been the king, now I get to go back to being the hero. One of his cruelest hand-to-hand -hand encounters had happened when Hujalak, king of the Yats, was killed in Friesland, sort of northwestern Germany on the coast. The people's friend and lord, Hrethel's son, slaked a, ward, a sword blade's thirst for blood. But down he goes. Now, it's, it's just talking about the uh, trials he's come through, but let me come to the speech. Um, 2419, he was sad at heart, unsettled yet ready, sensing his death. <coughs> sensing his death. His fate hovered near, unknowable but certain. It would soon claim his coffered soul, part life from limbs. Before long, the prince's spirit would spin free from his body. Beowulf, son of Actheo, spoke. Many a skirmish I survived when I was young, and many times of war. I remember them well. At seven I was fostered out by my father, left in the charge of my people's lord. King Hrethel kept me and took care of me, was open-handed, behaved like a kinsman. While I was his ward, he treated me no worse as a ween about the palace than one of his own boys. Here I'll be out, and Hectin. And my own, or my own Hujalak. For the eldest, Herbiald, an unexpected deathbed was laid out through a brother's doing, the sin of Cain. Then Haithkin bent his horn-tipped bow and loosed the arrow that destroyed his life. He shot wide and buried a shaft in the flesh and blood of his own brother. The offense was beyond redress, a wrong footing of the heart's affections for who could avenge the prince's life or pay his death price? Remember, there's a wear guild, there's a blood price. Well, who's going to pay the blood price? It's a kin against kin. You pay a, a wear guild, a man price, for when your kin is slain by another tribe. But this is within. There's no one to redress this. This is a, a, an injustice that cannot be redressed. It was like the misery felt by an old man who has lived to see his son's body swing on the gallows. It's unnatural, in other words. He begins to keen and weep for his boy, watching the raven gloat where he hangs. He can be of no help. The wisdom of age is worthless to him. Morning after morning, he wakes to remember that his child is gone. He has no interest in living on until another heir is born in the hall, now that his firstborn has entered death's dominion forever. So again, the sense of futility. The ter and also a terrific description of the loss of a child and the horror for the parent. He gazes sorrowfully at his son's dwelling, the banquet hall bereft of all delight, the windswept hearthstone, the horsemen are sleeping, the warriors underground, what was is no more, no tunes from the harp, no cheer raised in the yard. Alone with his longing, he lies down on his bed and sings a lament. Everything seems too large, the steadings and the fields. Such was the feeling of loss endured by the Lord of the Yats after Herbiald's death. Um, no, why is he recounting these things while he's thinking about what he's about to do? He knows he's going to die himself. The, the loss of life and the futility of it, it's, it's before it, that sense of sorrow. Even as he goes out in battle and he's going to fight once more and he's going to act like a, a, a hero, he knows that everything's about to come to a terrible end. And he, he talks about how the best of life is always ripped away. That's what he's meditating on. It's this terrible, sorrowful lament at loss. 
The treasures that Hudulak lavished on me, 2490, I paid for when I fought. As fortune allowed me with my glittering sword, he gave me land and the security land brings, so that he had no call to go looking for some lesser champion. I marched ahead of him, always there at the front of the line. And I shall fight like that for as long as I live, as long as this sword shall last, which has stood me in good stead late and soon ever since I killed Day Raven the Frank in front of the two armies. Beowulf spoke, 2510, made a formal boast for the last time. I risked my life often when I was young. Now I am old. But as a king of the people, I shall pursue this fight for the glory of winning. If the evil one will only abandon his earth fort and face me in the open. And he addressed each dear companion one final time, the fighters in their helmets. I would rather not use a weapon if I knew another way to grapple with the dragon and made good my boast as I did against Grendel in days gone by. But I shall be meeting molten venom in the fire he breathes. So I go forth in mail shirt and shield. I won't shift a foot when I meet the cave guard. What occurs on the wall between the two of us will turn out as fate. Overseer of men decides. I am resolved. I scorn further words against the skyborn foe. And he tells them to stay at the barrow and wait and see. And what do they do? They abandon him. They flee. When the dragon comes forth, they all flee from him except one. And his name is Wiglaf, 2602. Wiglaf stays by his side. And then they, they fight. And they battle. And Beowulf's bitten in the neck by the fangs of the dragon, 2692. And the lifeblood comes welling out. So he is dying. And in that moment, The king gathered his strength, strength, 2702, and drew a stabbing knife to the sword. Now good, now he's just, all he has left is a little knife. He carried on his belt, sharpened for a battle. He struck it deep in the dragon's flank. Beowulf dealt it a deadly wound. They had killed the enemy. Courage quelled his life. That pair of kinsmen, Beowulf and Wiglaf, partners in nobility had destroyed the foe. So every man should act be at hand when needed. But now for the king, this would be the last of his many labors and triumphs in the world. And when the wound dealt by the ground burner earlier began to scald and swell, Beowulf discovered deadly poison separating inside of him, surges of nausea. And so in his wisdom, the prince realized his state and struggled towards a seat. And so from then it speaks uh, at the last, but I'll, and I'll have to skip over that because we're running out of time. But then there's a funeral at the end, and there's a wailing and a sense of a terrible loss. Uh, the, the funeral 28, uh, 21, fit for a hero and a king. And it was hard then on Wiglaf, having to watch the one he held so dear there on the ground, going through his death agony. The dragon from underneath, his nightmarish destroyer, lay destroyed as well, utterly without life. All the same, he is dead. Uh, and I'll pick it up just towards the conclusion of this, because it goes on a fair bit here, but I, I'll, I'll read the conclusion. Uh, uh, 3156. Then the Yat people began to construct a mound. on a headland, high and imposing, a marker that sailors could see from far away. And in 10 days they had done the work. It was their hero's memorial. What remained from the fire they housed inside it, behind a wall as worthy of him as their workmanship could make it. And they buried torques in the barrow, these golden neck guards, and jewels and a trove of such thing as trespassing men had once dared to drag from the hoard. They let the ground keep that ancestral treasure, gold under gravel, gone to earth, as useless to men now as it ever was. That's the Christian poet's comment. The gold of what good. Then 12 warriors rode around the tomb, chieftain sons, champions about all of them distraught, chanting in dirges, mourning his loss as a man and a king. They extolled his heroic nature and exploits and gave thanks for his greatness, which was the proper thing. 
For a man could praise, should praise a prince whom he holds dear and cherishes memory when that moment comes when he has to be convoyed from his bodily home. So the Yat people, his hearth companions, sorrowed for the Lord who had been laid low. They said that of all the kings upon earth, he was the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people and keenest to win fame. Uh, just before that, it also talks about how the kingdom is now open by the armies, by the tribes around them, and it's not going to last. So all we get, there's this terrible, as I say, there's a great memory of the deeds that were done. The glory is, is marked, it's clear. Uh, Beowulf's heroism is, is uh, clearly important for the poet to tell, and his character, as much as his uh, military, comp, uh, military um, triumphs, but the futility of it all. That's the, the signal emphasis here, which I just find striking. And we'll just leave it off that. Next time we'll come to read Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. It's uh, Middle English, but we'll find it with uh, King Arthur and his knights. I think you'll like it a lot. It's a great poem in itself. I'll see you then.